Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. Uh, Pastor Abe is away today, and he wanted me to let you guys know that he misses you, is praying for you. Uh, but today, excited and honored to be able to uh, dive in the Word together this morning. So as we get started, let me ask you this question. Have you ever assumed something to be true that you later found out was false? Have you ever missed the mark in that way? Uh, you know, several years ago, I was leading a missions trip in Los Angeles, California, and our team was preparing to drive to one of our ministry locations that we were serving at. And uh, our group was large enough that we needed two separate vehicles in order to get everyone from point A to point B. So that morning, we loaded up and we left. I was driving one van. My wife was driving the other. I got her permission to tell on her this morning, so don't judge me, okay? Um, so if you've ever driven in downtown Los Angeles, you know that it's a little crazy, and you know that trying to caravan or ride together is just all but impossible. So um, a few times we tried that early on the trip, but we just realized it's not going to happen. So we plugged in the, the location separately into our GPS uh, devices on our phones, and, and we drove. So 45 minutes later, I get there, half the team unloads, and I call my wife. And I'm like, hey, where are you? And she goes, oh, I'm not there yet, still driving. I said, so what's, what's the, what's the you know, address? Let me just make sure we're tracking here. And so she reads the, the number. I'm like, yeah. And she reads the street. And I'm like, yeah. And then she gets to the zip code. And I'm like, no, um, wrong zip code. So right address, wrong zip code. She had driven 45 minutes in the opposite direction. So now she's in the heat of LA traffic. It takes her three hours to get over to the, the service location that we were at. By the time she gets there, we're done. And she gets to drive back to LA, downtown LA. So um, the, the whole point is, is this, is that the, the group as a whole learned a very important lesson that day. And that lesson is this, assumptions can be dangerous. You see, you know, my wife saw the, the um, address and she just sort of assumed, oh, that must be right, and she clicked one with the wrong zip code. And I would challenge us that as Jesus followers, we too often end up in places that we never thought we would be simply because we have made some very dangerous assumptions about the words of Christ, and I want to read this passage to you. This is a passage we're going to be looking at together today. It's in Matthew chapter 11, it's verses 28 through 30. And in this passage, Jesus gives an invitation. I want to read this to you. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. So you see, Jesus gives this invita invitation, but perhaps we as his followers have misunderstood what it even means to be with Jesus. Further, while I, I, I've yet to meet someone who's following Jesus that wants to turn him down on his invitation of what he's offering to us, which is rest, I think we also don't know what that rest really looks like practically. And equally concerning, I don't think many of us know how to fully enter into it. So today what we're going to do at our core is challenge some assumptions. We're going to challenge the assumptions that we have so that we might learn how to enter into a more deep experience of the presence of Jesus in his life. So there's two questions that I think will help us get there that have to be dealt with if we're going to experience this transformation. And by answering this question, we're going to be able to deal with these assumptions and therefore enter into rest. So you guys ready? Let's strap in together. First question is this, how do you come to Jesus? How in the world do you come to Jesus? Let's think about the Christian life as a whole. Okay, first I want to talk about some terms. The first term is this, discipleship. If you've been around in church, you've heard that word before. And today, I'm going to define discipleship as engaging in the processes and engaging in the practices that Jesus did with the intent to become as Jesus is. So in other words, discipleship is about doing the things that we know Jesus did with the hope of becoming more like him. 
In other words, we, we often view discipleship as just giving ourselves to particular active exercises that we think are going to grow our faith. We want to read our Bibles, right? We want to take time and pray. We want to serve others. We want to have moments of silence. We want to do Sabbath, all these different spiritual activities. But I want to talk about another term that's closely related but a little different. And that term is spiritual formation, which we're going to talk about a lot today, which I'm defining as anything that forms you. Spiritual formation is anything that forms you, whether intentionally or unintentionally, into the kind of person that you're actively becoming. The reason that I'm taking some time to sort of flesh out these two different terms is not because inherently I believe they're really all that different. They're not. In fact, spiritual formation and discipleship should be synonymous. But that doesn't change the fact that these two terms have been divorced from one another in many forms of our Western Christianity. So this, just let's, let's boil it down here. This is why a person can participate in what we would label as discipleship for 10, 20, even 50 years and still lack deep inner transformation being deeply changed by Jesus. Um, the author and pastor Pete Scazzaro once referenced someone that he heard that he's been a 20-year Christian, but instead of being a 20-year-old Christian, he was a one-year-old Christian 20 times. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. It's the fact that we can follow Jesus for a long time, but not change. That's why discipleship in its own, in the way we think about it, has to be challenged. We've mistakenly assumed that, quote, doing the right things will always yield the right results, but it's not so simple. And that's why Jesus gives us this invitation in Matthew 11. That's why it's so important that we hear him when he says, come to me, come to me. Verse 29, he says this, let me teach you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you'll find rest for your souls. So this text, what it's revealing to us is that Jesus alone is saying, I know the way to transformation. Will you let me show you? Not only can he do it, but he wants to. That's why there's an invitation. He's actually inviting you in. The determining uh, matter here is, are we going to listen to the words of the mouth of Christ? He says, let me. Let me. Are we willing to let God teach us. Sometimes we're so desperate for change. Have you ever been there? You're so desperate for something to transform in your life that you just go after it. We try to do it all on our own, don't we? We exhaust ourselves trying to become someone new in our own strength. Uh, We pick up every little self-help trick that we can along the way, yet Jesus challenges that. He squares up and he speaks to it and he says, let me teach you. There's this article in New York Magazine that reports that the self-help movement has grown and mushroomed into an $11 billion industry, yes, with a B, billion, dedicated to telling us how we can and should improve our lives. This is what the article said. I'd like to read this to you. It says, today there are at least 45,000 self-help books in print of the optimize everything cult we now call self-help. Today, every section of the store or webpage overflows with instructions, anecdotes, and homilies from self-help books. These books replace doctors, priests, pastors, therapists, and maybe even parents, senators, and teachers with public personalities who gave names to the problems of millions. So I want to have a little fun this morning, and I'd like to read you some of the titles of some popular self-help books and the things that we've put our stamp of approval on as a culture and said, yes, I will pay for that. Yes, I will read that. The first is this, how to make people like you in 90 seconds or less. Wouldn't it be nice, right? Another one, influence, the psychology of persuasion, business and scientific strategies for bending others to your will. Another one, 59 seconds, change your life in under a minute, uh, provides behavioral tweaks in the amount of time that anyone can spare. The four-hour work week, which is essentially self-help's version of get rich quick or get good at anything, master it in about five minutes. 
Then there's the four-hour chef, the simple path to cooking like a pro, learning anything and living, quote, the good life. And last but not least, how to think more about sex. Yes, that is the title of the book. It's a bestseller. This is the culture that we live in, church. This is the culture that we live in. This is a world where self-help is offering constant assertions that you can solve your greatest problem if you just get the right information. It's more easy and ever, however, in this culture where all of the information is at our fingertips, where we can go, there's 45,000 plus books. Uh, It's all there. But what that does to our souls is it creates this problem where we can get burned out really, really quickly. We go out and we try really hard. And when we inevitably reach the end of ourselves, which we will, by the way, we find that there are some things that self-help cannot help. And in the midst of all that noise, in the midst of all that distraction, Christ comes to us and he says, I'm promising you rest. But in order to receive that rest, we have to submit to him. We have to acknowledge no matter how much I help myself, I'm still going to lack. And I need him to show me the path to transformation. And I don't know about you, but as an obstinate person myself, you know, when I, when I hear about this, that Jesus is revealing himself as a humble, gentle teacher, this, this humble teacher who is full of gentleness and compassion, he's offering rest to a very hurried person in me. He's offering transformation to a person who perpetually misses the mark in me. Now that's good news for me, and I think it's good news for all of us. Amen? So we have to participate in the deeds of discipleship, but this is what the the pivot is. Yes, we should read our Bible. Yes, we should pray. Yes, we should be people who are participating in these, these activities, but let's get one thing very clear. It's God who takes those things, those actions, and breathes upon them and spiritually forms us into his image and likeness. He's the one doing the work. So if you would, just consider with me um, the process of taking a shower. It is something that we all do, hopefully. I mean, I hope that I can say that with confidence, that we all shower. Um, but, but I believe that this process of taking a shower, it, it can really help us better understand the spiritual life. So in the shower, okay, Well, we are the ones that do the scrubbing. It's actually something else, the soap, that does all of the cleaning. For instance, you can get in the shower, and you can scrub all day long, and you can scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub, but without soap, there's actually not much cleaning that's going to happen. Church, that picture right there is is a picture of our best attempts at discipleship without the spiritual formation that only comes from the Spirit. You see, there, there's something outside of our own activity that we need in order to be changed, and it's the Holy Spirit. So we have to stop just scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and let the Holy Spirit gently come alongside and say, hey, do you want me to participate in what's happening right now? And this is, this is a total shift in the way we think. And I think this is exactly what the theologian and philosopher John Coe of Biola University had in mind when he wrote this. He says, spiritual disciplines do not transform. They only become relational opportunities to open the heart to the spirit who transforms. Get that. So you're saying spiritual disciplines on their own aren't enough. We mistakenly believe that coming to Jesus is only what happens when we do certain activities. But the beauty of Christ's invitation reveals to us that even spiritual disciplines, as helpful as they are, are a means to an end at best. What I mean is that spiritual disciplines are only as effective in forming your soul as they are effective in ushering you into the presence of Jesus Christ. So the implications of this are huge. That means that the goal of prayer isn't to pray. It means that the same is true of fasting, silence, 
Scripture. The goal of reading your Bible is not to say you read your Bible. The goal of worshiping is not to say you went to church and every other spiritual practice applies. The goal of every single one of those things is solely this, to encounter Jesus. That is why spiritual disciplines at their best are only a piece of what it means to come to Jesus every day of our lives. And that's why I believe that we have to, we have to expand our vision this morning. To see that the life that God is calling us to is much bigger than maybe we've even thought up to this point. So that means that spiritual formation, the people we're becoming, the trajectory we're on, it's neutral and it's unbiased. That means that every single person breathing in oxygen right now in this room is currently being formed and influenced in numerous ways by something during this season of life. Another theologian, Kevin Van Hooser, he says, culture is in the full-time business of spiritual formation. And what he means is that we are constantly being influenced and formed into specific types of people by the forces around us, by whether we realize it or not. I mean, there's billion-dollar industries of marketing that their, their focus is to distract you or to form you into wanting what they're offering. So whether the transformation that you experience in your day-to-day life is godly or whether the the transformation that you experience in your day-to-day life is worldly entirely depends upon the things that you give your mind to, the things that you give your schedule to, the things that you focus on, the thoughts that you think, the content you devour. Those things change us. So we have to get this picture. God is constantly at work. He's constantly on mission in your life to try to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Our goal of life is to be with God and become like Jesus. That's it. But here's the other part. We have a world and an enemy of our soul who is constantly trying to malform us or deform us into the image of its own distorted self. So, Paul, this is, fortunately for you and I, we're not the first people to deal with this. Paul talks about this explicitly in Romans 12, chapter uh, chapter 12, verse 2. He says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Paul reveals this concern in this letter. He's concerned for his fellow Christians that they're going to be wrapped up and integrated into the behaviors and the customs around them. And I believe that that warning, it it doesn't just apply to first century Jews. It applies to us right here, right now in Frederick, Maryland. Okay, There's another faulty assumption that's at work here. And that is this, that most followers of Jesus mistakenly believe that formation only happens when we're active. The formation only happens where we're active. But the unavoidable truth here is that the vast majority of the way that we're changed, the way that we grow, the way that we're formed is what happens to us as people when we're just passively going through life. So my wife, Steph, and I we started dating in high school. We met in fourth grade. And um, growing up, as we, as we were dating, I, I, we spent a lot of time at each other's houses. So I got a good picture of what life was like in her family. She got a good picture of what life was like in my family. And because of that, we very quickly began to realize that we just did some things really different. Um, so for example, Steph would always do the dishwasher's job for it. I don't know if there's anyone in this room that suffers from this same ailment. Um, But what I mean is that she would essentially wash all of the dishes before putting each one of them into the dishwasher. Um, And for me, that was troubling. You know, it was a big red flag for me in the relationship um, because I always believed that the dishwasher enjoyed its job considering it is the one task that a dishwasher is built to facilitate. So I would put the dishes in, well, a little dirty and expect that they would get clean, right? So Steph was not having it. I was not having her way. She was not having mine. And then we got married. And then we got married. So life went on. 
we continued to have this debacle. She would do it her way. I would do it mine. And I remember one day as I was loading the dishwasher and I finished up, I closed the door, and then it dawned on me as I stood in horror, realizing that I had just washed off every single dish that I had put into that dishwasher and hit start. Now here's the point. Um, Steph didn't manipulate me. She didn't coerce me. She didn't threaten me with violence that I better wash off those dishes before I... No, I just watched her do it for years. I just spent time with her every day for years. And what happened was I changed my, lo- my mind along the way and I was transformed into a new person who washes the dishes, hallelujah, right? <laughs> okay, here's the point, guys. Who we give ourselves to and what we give ourselves to on an ongoing basis changes us. It changes who we are. So let's think about it this way. Let's say hypothetical person, really consistent, spends 20 minutes a day every morning with coffee and a lit candle, just reading scripture, being with Jesus, but then spends four hours every night binging Netflix. Who do we really think is forming that person. It's a question that we don't want to ask ourselves, but we ought to if we're going to take seriously the fact that the charge in life is to be with Jesus and become like him. Who do we really think is forming us? With the use of technology, you know, more than ever, it's easy to get distracted. We can invite folks into our living rooms, into our cars as we drive, our headphones as we mow the lawn, all to influence us. So we're listening to podcasts, we're reading books, we're reading blogs, social media posts, and so much more that's all forming us passively when we have our guard down, when we're doing other things, when we're multitasking through life. So despite any discipleship that's happening for a couple of hours a week in our lives, we find that the things that change us most and shape our minds the most are the passive behaviors and customs of the world that Paul warned against. So we have to realize today that all of our actions, all of our thoughts, all of our decisions, they're doing something to us. In other words, our habits are not neutral. They play a key role in the people that we're actively becoming, the people we surround ourselves with, the content we devour, the role models that we're going to choose to imitate, the composition of our schedules, they're each playing a role in the person you are. Please hear me today. Spiritual formation does not only happen when we want it to. Spiritual formation is happening all the time. Jesus himself lived by this and recognized it. Okay, so Jesus didn't go up to his disciples and say, hey, Maybe we should start like a Monday night Torah study for like an hour and a half. We'll read the Torah, we'll ask some questions, we'll converse, and then we'll go back to fishing. He said, leave everything. Follow me. Pick up your cross. Do every minute of every day following me, listening to me, learning from me. Friends, when we realize that coming to Jesus... It's not just doing some churchy things. Coming to Jesus on a daily basis is living every minute of your life in constant awareness that his presence is with you and he is for you and you can live and do everything that from the mundane to the exciting with Jesus. He's not bored by your work week. He's not bored by your family schedule. He's not disinterested in the details of your life. He wants to walk with you, but we're too distracted to see that he's with us. You see, Peter, man, this guy, he was constantly failing, and he made some of the biggest blunders out of all the 12 disciples. But what we see from start to finish is that Peter was transformed into a new person. The Peter you meet at the beginning of the gospel accounts is not the same Peter that you meet in Acts. Okay, so what did he do? What did he do? Well, he left everything. He started spending every day watching Jesus. He started talking to Jesus every day. He asked questions of Jesus every day. He made mistakes in front of Jesus every day. He was corrected. He was taught. He he denied Jesus. He failed Jesus. He repented to Jesus. Every single activity you can do, he did with Jesus, and he was changed. 
In the same way, church, you and I can be changed as we do every single thing with Jesus. Now, does that mean that, okay, we shouldn't do Bible study, prayer groups, life groups, discipline time in private with God? Well, of course not. What it does mean is that we just can't see those things as a magic bullet. We can't count on some, some practices or routine as a magical concoction that's going to somehow transform me, and I don't have to do the relational work with God. So, after telling his followers that I've got a trade for you, I'm going to take your weariness, your biggest problems, and here's what I'm going to exchange it for, rest and an easy yoke. He tells him this, and he starts talking about this whole thing of a yoke. And I don't know about you, but yokes are not things that I often hear about or talk about in everyday conversation. Um, but in Jesus' time, they did. So let's dig in here. A yoke was a wooden cross piece that was placed and fastened over the necks of two animals. And it was often attached to a plow or a cart um, that would be pulled through the fields to, to do work. So why in the world is Jesus talking about this tool, this yoke? Well, he's saying that he has a yoke that's easy, and he has a burden that's light. And partially what Jesus is doing is that he's comparing himself as the new high priest to the current high priest and Pharisees and Sadducees of the religious time. Jesus is saying that for me as a new high priest, I'm bringing a different kind of yoke. The yoke that you're, that you're familiar with is one that's heavy, it's impossible to hold up, it's very religious, it doesn't end with any life-giving uh, sense of wholeness, it's just about going through the motions to make sure you're good with God. But Jesus says, I have something different. My yoke is not enslaving, it's not overly taxing, it's not impossible to hold up, and here's why. A yoke was always for two animals, so when Jesus places upon you his yoke, he doesn't just place it upon you, he wears it with you. And by the way, he does the heavy lifting. So as you walk, you're not walking with a yoke of just trying to get through life. You're bearing the weight of your life with Jesus as you take each and every step. And behind you, it, 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 so it's this beautiful picture of releasing burdens so that Jesus can carry them. And for all of this talk about easy yokes, we can get over-focused on that, can't we? Man, the easy yoke of Jesus is just so wonderful. I don't have to carry anything. Hallelujah. We just go on and, and we have this easygoing sort of mentality towards following Jesus. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that's very important. Um, even if it is an easy yoke, Jesus has still given a yoke. That means that he still put something on us. It's still our responsibility to carry it, to take the next step, to be faithful with what he has given to us. And again, while Jesus does the heavy lifting, we're still called to obey him. We're still called to follow through on the things that he's given in his, in his word. So this, this whole invitation, it's given far and wide to everyone who's weary Everyone who's weighed down, and it doesn't matter what is doing the weighing down in your life. So, so let's get personal for a minute. Look within your own life. What is weighing you down today? What are the burdens that you are currently carrying? Is it, is it the burden of guilt for past sin? Come to Jesus. He's invited you close. Is it the burden of worry? about money or your future or what life is going to look like or your kids? What is it? The response is the same. Come to Jesus. Maybe it's the burden of battered relationships between a spouse, siblings, parents, friends. Come to Jesus. So we've answered this, this first question. How do we come to Jesus? And it's quite simple. It's just hard. We come to Jesus by living every moment of every day with an awareness that God is looking to be with us. He's looking to teach us and therefore transform us into new people. And by answering that question right there, we have exposed this faulty assumption that coming to Jesus only happens through really specific actions, church stuff as we would call it. And from here, we have the ability to discuss this second question, which is, okay, what is the rest 
that Jesus is inviting us to live in? What is the specific kind of rest that God is offering to you? And the reason this question is so important is because if we stop here and we say, okay, right now I'm going to start living all of my life before and with God. I'm going to allow him to be the one who influences me more than all of the other media that I consume. And I'm going to adjust my schedule. If we, if we do all that, but at the same time we misunderstand the kind of rest or the type of rest, if you will, that Jesus is looking to give to us, then we're just going to continue to live internally fatigued as we strive and try really hard. So here's an important question, very important theological question for you. Does anyone else help ta- hate taking naps? Okay, anyone? There's, there's no one in here, okay? There's like four people in the first service. If you're in here and you're too scared to raise your hand, I'm going to raise mine first. I hate taking naps. Solidarity, okay? Solidarity with like the three other people in here. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why I hate taking naps. Um, It's very simple. I hate taking naps because I wake up in a very foul mood every single time. You can ask my wife. She will be honest with you. I'm crabby after a nap. And at first I thought, this has got to be me. Like, there's something wrong here. Maybe I was doing too short of a nap. I would do like a 30-minute power nap. So let's do a few hours. Didn't help. I was even more angry. I woke up in such a bad mood. So, so here's the thing. Um, when we wake up from a nap, in, in, if you've ever experienced this, whether it's consistent or not, and you're more drowsy than you were before, think about that feeling for a minute. Many of us can relate to it. Because we often think in the same way that, Physically, a nap will just take care of us so we can get through the rest of our day. That taking a spiritual nap or spiritual rest will ultimately help us become recovered and whole and full of new life. We think that spiritual rest is going to come from taking a spiritual nap. From taking a break of all the different activities that we're we're having spiritually. If I'm just too overwhelmed, I don't have time to read my Bible. I'm just too overwhelmed. The kids are screaming, I can't go to church today. And we we take a break. We think, I just need some me time. And we minister to ourselves by doing this. But what happens is the same exact thing. We take a spiritual nap and we wake up worse off than we were before. More distant from God, more confused as to where we are and where He is. And the whole point of this is that we have to think about rest differently. So for me, I'm not a napper, I'm just gonna say it, I'm not a napper. But what I will do is say, man, I really need to do something that's gonna decelerate the speed of my soul. I need to go sit in a very, very quiet room and read after my kids go to bed. Or I need to pull out my guitar and just be alone. For a few minutes. That, that, let me tell you, nap doesn't do it for me, but that does. So I might refuse to take naps, but I'm going to find another way. And we do too. We can't just pull ourselves from spiritual activity and say, I'll get back to it when I feel up for it. No, no, no. We have to find new ways of becoming intimate with God so that we can experience all that he has for us. For example, there are areas in our lives that we have not considered to be connected, that are very, very closely connected. For example, we can't live hurried in our minds, in our bodies, in our souls, and at the same time, welcome in this deep rest from Jesus. To say it plainly, rest and hurry are opposing forces. We cannot live hurried and walk in the easy yoke of Jesus at the same time. One of my favorite theologians, his, his name is Dallas Willard, and he once called hurry, he's talking about hurry, and he calls it the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. And he said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Now, if you were to ask Nathan, what is the greatest threat to your spiritual life? I don't know that I would pick hurry, I don't know that I would. I don't know if the greatest threat to my spiritual life would be the smartphone that's sitting in my pocket, or if it's the TV that hangs in my living room or the calendar in my kitchen. But what we find, church, is that when we are enslaved to lives that are overhurried, we don't have enough time to slow down and take Jesus up on his invitation, which is come to me and find rest. 
Jesus has said, come to me, but we're too hurried. We're too distracted. We're too focused on other things. And we think eventually we'll get around to it, but we don't. The more busy that our lives become, the harder it is for us to choose Jesus' presence for the day over the current distraction. There's this New York Times article that's entitled Power Sleep. And this, this article was written by a group of sleep experts that um, revealed prior to Thomas Edison's light bulb, which was invented in 1879, the average American slept for 10 to 11 hours per night. The same article goes on to reveal that the national sleep average today is seven hours and is quickly falling more towards six hours per night. So get this, we are more active than any society in the history of human existence, and we do all that we do on less rest than any previous generation. That is certainly not the way of Jesus. That is certainly not the way to rest and wholeness and transformation. And what that really does is it helps turn on our head this this whole notion that we can just keep on doing what we're doing. It means that today there's a fork in the road. There's a radical choice that's been laid before you by the King of Kings. Are you going to slow down to be present with and enter into the rest of Jesus? Or are you going to be too hurried and distracted to give time to what matters most? Are we going to ignore Jesus' teaching and avoid becoming the people we want to be because of this? Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. So many of us want intimacy with God, but so few of us, I believe, are willing to do what it takes to get there, which is to slow down our lives. We can't accept this invitation to receive rest without first learning how to be still in God's presence so we can deeply know this God who is love. It's sort of like this. When I receive an RSVP for a wedding, I have to realize if I say yes to this, I'm saying yes to one thing, but I'm also saying no to about 50 other things. And that's the way we have to see our lives. When we say yes to one thing, we're saying no to a lot of other things that God may be trying to do in you. Now, we can talk about this till we're blue in the face, but we need to be careful because this isn't to say that we just need to become, you know, ancient monks, run out a monastery, cash in the possessions, and just live a very, very simple life where we do nothing and sing kumbaya on the weekends. No, it's not that. It's, it's in fact, much more life-giving than that. What, what we're talking about today is the difference between having a full life with plenty to do, and having a hurried and distracted life with way too much to do. And I hate to admit it, but there's been so many times in my own life where I realized, man, I just have too much to do. There's no way for me to get done everything I need to get done. And that's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is to give time to what matters most. And this rest that Jesus is inviting us to is one that can be experienced in the worst moments, in the most chaotic-filled times, in the hardest circumstances, in the most painful moments of your life. This isn't to say that our lives need to be totally idle, that we have to cease from all movement and requirements, but Paul outlines it so well in 2 Corinthians 4.16. He says this, it says, this is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Paul introduces this vital truth that we have to embrace, okay? And that is that Christ's eternal rest, it's not dictated by what we are presently experiencing. So think about a time when you felt overwhelmed, when, when anxiety was crouching at your door, when you were feeling as though you didn't know what to do to fix it. What do we do? We often turn internally to try to fix what's happening. But Jesus shows us that um, by trying to change our mindset, by trying to change our, our thoughts and just doing what we can, 
there's, there's actually an inability to really receive what God is giving to us. In John 14, 27, Jesus said this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Jesus revealed that true rest has to be externally given to us. It's not something that we possess on our own. Jesus' rest, it's stronger than whatever you're facing. Jesus' peace, it's stronger than the conflict and the chaos that surrounds you. And we're not going to find it by looking inside. We're not going to find it by just digging more deeply. We're going to find it by turning our gaze to the Lord who is available and him externally giving what we lack. So we've asked these two questions. How do we come to Jesus? Well, first, we come to Jesus by slowing down to live every minute of our life in connection and fellowship with God. And what is the rest that God is specifically offering to you? It's to externally receive the resources of heaven anytime you need them, not just when things are going well. Matthew 16, 24, as we come to a close, says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your way, take up your cross, and follow me. So here's my question as we come to a close. How is it that Jesus can say, come to me and find rest? But at the same time, just a few chapters um, previously, he can say this other statement, which is, whoever wants to be my follower must take up their cross to die. So which is it? Come to me to find rest or come to me to pick up a cross and die? How can the death of self and rest for the soul both take place simultaneously? Well, guys, I believe it's because Jesus' rest is not what we thought it was. I believe it's because coming to Jesus is, is not what we've believed that it was. We've been led astray by these assumptions that we make that the right activities are always going to yield the right results, that formation only happens when we're active, that we can totally avoid slowing down and still enter Jesus' rest. And lastly, that Jesus' rest is somehow found inside ourselves rather than externally given to us because we don't have it. Today, Jesus' invitation can set us free from every single one of those assumptions that we've made. So we have to respond to the invitation today to live unhurried lives that are in constant connection with him, to look to God, not to ourselves or others for transformation, that we we can make the trade today. Heavy burdens for an easy yoke. I want to ask you to bow as as we close this morning. Today, wherever you're at with God, The fact is this, is that he wants to encounter you. So here's some questions for you. What's forming you right now? Who is forming you most? Is it Jesus or is it some other thing? What burdens do you need to release to Jesus today? Is it past pain, present difficulty, future worry? How can you begin to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life? Slow down. Be present with God. And lastly, what have you been looking for internally that today you need to receive externally? Have you been looking in yourself for rest, fulfillment, joy, peace? Come to Jesus. He is the only one who can offer it in its fullness. So Lord, as we come to you today and as we make a choice and a shift to do our best to come to you, not just in this moment, but in every moment, Help us to know, God, that our choices matter and that we can be people who say yes and amen to every good thing that you want to do in and through us. Maybe you're here today and and you don't even know this Jesus who has invited you to come close. And today you're saying, man, I I need to respond to the the invitation of coming to Jesus. I don't know this teacher. I, I haven't experienced this love, but I want to. And if that's you today, I want to invite you right now to say yes to the invitation of Christ, 
to come to him and experience his life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, I wanna experience every single thing that God has for me in this moment. Anyone? Yeah, I see your hands. See your hands, yeah. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Well, Lord, right now, I am in agreement with my brothers and sisters that, Lord, more than it is about us saying yes to you, it's about the fact that you've said yes to us. So, Lord, we, we welcome in what you've already wanted to do, to make us alive in you by turning from our sin, by enjoining ourselves to you and saying, have your way in my life. Lord, we follow you today. We make a commitment to saying yes to every good and perfect gift that comes from above. And we ask it in the name above every other name, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. Can you give the Lord praise this morning? Thank you, Lord. Well, church, it is so good to be with you today. I want to take a minute and just invite our ministry teams to go ahead and come forward. Um, we're gonna, Don't rush off. If you need to pray with someone, we have people here that would love to do that with you. Uh, please stop by Guest Central on your way out. If you're new here, we would love to connect with you. God bless you as you go into Holy Week. Looking forward to what God is going to do next weekend. Walk with Jesus.